You'll see when you do an exegesis, it's tempting to try to plod through verse by verse, picking out words and phrases, commenting on them, and moving through in sequence. It can be done that way, but the danger is that you'll list an atomized sequence of observations that don't cohere into a whole reading of the passage. It's all right to move around the passage uh, if you want to, to move back and forth and to take cues from the passage and to look out into the wider letter and then come back to the passage. An exegesis requires you to stay focused on the passage, so the passage is your Again, yeah, it's your lens for reading the rest of the letter. But don't go off and write a general essay on 1 Corinthians. Always come back to the passage uh, as your main focus for discussing the rest of the letter. So what are these divisions that Paul has identified? We get to verse 12. What I mean is that each one of you says, I belong to Paul, or I belong to Apollos, or I belong to Cephas, or I belong to Christ. This is a case where the King James, uh, the King James Version is uh, perhaps a little bit more helpful for us. Now I say this, that every one of you safe. <laughs> I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, I am of Cephas, I am of Christ. This brings us back to Margaret Mitchell's argument from 1991 again. This is the language, to say I am of someone is what a slave or a child would say of a master or a parent. So Paul is portraying his Corinthian audience in rather childish terms, actually. Um, it, it would be very easy for us to miss, and I'm very grateful to Margaret Mitchell for doing that trawl through the Greek literature to come up with this observation. Um, all of a sudden there's a different nuance there now, because for Paul to for Paul to mimic these Corinthian statements in this language is to depict them as being rather childish. And actually we'll find he accuses them of being children and asks them to stop being children a number of times in the letter, the end of chapter 4, uh, the end of chapter 13, and somewhere in the middle of chapter 14. And then um, a chap called Geoffrey Asher, who's also in the reading list, points out that Paul's rhetorical style in chapter 15 is typical of a teacher admonishing a student as well. All very subtle things that one couldn't pick up if these people didn't spend a long time looking into it and then we get to read what they tell us. So we've got Paul complaining that there are groups of Corinthians affiliating themselves with the, the apostles that baptised these different groups, because as we move on, he says, is Christ divided? Well, that's supposed to be a shocking rhetorical question. The answer ought to be no, of course not. Was Paul cru crucified for you? Well, again, that's supposed to be an even more shocking rhetorical question. Of course not. Or were you baptised in the name of Paul? I'm thankful that I baptised none of you except Crispus and Gaius, lest anyone should say that you were baptised in my name. So it looks like you've got Paul who's baptised... Oh, let's just carry on. I did baptise also the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptised anyone else. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> um, baptism of households... I suppose we have to run our eye down to point number seven. Um, we see it in 1 Corinthians 16. Look forward to 1616, though. Um, Paul absent-mindedly remembers that he might have baptised Stephanus and his whole household in 1 Corinthians 1, where it suits him to play down the baptism because he's objecting to groups of Corinthians affiliating with the apostle that baptised them. Although when you get to 1616, he says, I recommend Stephanus as a, a jolly decent chap, and I think you ought to submit to his authority. <laughs> so, so Paul's actually getting his man <laughs> into a position of authority by the end of the letter, although he can 
barely remember having baptised him at the beginning. Um, but household, yes, household baptisms, we see evidence for this in Acts, um, and there's various other little bits of information there. Gaius and his household, Prisca and Aquila, providing their house for a church meeting, and Mary in Acts 12. So it looks like Apollos has been baptising in Corinth as well. Paul doesn't object to this. If you notice, Paul actually never objects to Apollos as such. He never objects to Apollos' teaching in Corinth. He never even mentions the content of Apollos' teaching. In 1 Corinthians 3, Paul says, Apollos and I work, uh, we, we cooperate together. Paul's very careful to mention that Paul plants and Apollos only waters, but still, he's happy for Apollos to be there and he's happy to call him an apostle. Um, he even says in chapter 16, I, I invited Apollos to come and see you, but he, he couldn't at the moment, but will as soon as he can. So there's no indication that Paul objects to Apollos as such. He objects to groups of Corinthians, probably house churches, affiliating themselves with different baptismal apostles. Um, he calls this dangerous division. Why might they affiliate themselves with the apostle that baptised them? Well, when we get into chapter 2 uh, and 3, Paul has rather a, a tirade against worldly wisdom and sophistry. Uh, he seems to have sophists in mind, um, people who peddle various kinds of philosophies, well, this is very common in the Greco-Roman world. People would, Stoics, Cynics, Epicureans, various philosophers um, would come around to the marketplaces and stand up and preach in the markets and gain adherence. More or less the pattern Paul is using. He's turning up in marketplaces and preaching his gospel. Um, but Paul's very careful to say in chapters 2 and 3 that Paul doesn't come from human wisdom. It's not his own wisdom. It's, it's God's wisdom. It's divine wisdom. Um, but you can see why, why the Corinthians might be, um, uh, households of Corinthians might be affiliating themselves with the apostle that baptised them. They want to get their baptismal apostle onto the household payroll because it would be classic for a Stoic or, or a different various philosophers to come to the marketplace, get a job for a few weeks or months in at the the house of a patron who is going to then feed the philosopher and um, give him board and lodging, he'd be on the payroll. He would now be a client of the patron. Um, the, the philosopher would uh, teach the household and the patron and the patron would gain social kudos through this process and the philosopher would get his bread and his pay. Um, Paul is actually refusing to go on to the payroll of anyone. When you get to 1 Corinthians 9, they seem to be complaining that Paul won't accept pay for preaching his gospel. He works with his own hands. He repeats this a number of times in his letters. Um, he's subverting these patron-client relations that you get in Greek Roman cities. In 2 Corinthians, it's become even more antagonistic. They're really upset that he won't submit to them as their client and be paid. Um, but we can see why we might get households affiliating themselves with different apostles. Um, it's often supposed that Cephas or Peter has been in Corinth too. He might have been. He's mentioned again <coughs> as travelling around with a wife in 1 Corinthians 9. But as some commentators mention, Paul, having listed Apollos and Cephas in 1 Corinthians 1, Paul only ever really engages with Apollos again. So it looks like Apollos is an issue. Cephas, Cephas may or may not have been in Corinth. Cephas might be just such a well-known name that Paul is mentioning him. Um, it, it's difficult to decide. But is there a Christ party? I am of Christ as we see in 1 Corinthians 1.12. Was there a group affili affiliating themselves with Paul, another with Apollos, another with Cephas, another with Christ? 
It's possible. Um, we get the sense from 1 Corinthians 12 to 14 that some of the Corinthians are boasting in their spiritual gifts, and particularly uh, tongues. They're babbling in tongues. And it's, it's, it, you get the sense that Paul is trying to curb their enthusiasm and suppress this uh, boasting in their spiritual gifts. And particularly, he downplays the gift of tongues, saying, I'd rather not speak in tongues at all uh, if it's going to cause confusion and dissension. Uh, so it's possible that they already, th some of the Corinthians already think they're speaking in tongues of men and angels, as he says in 1 Corinthians 13, that they are spiritually superior to other Corinthians who uh, don't have these spiritual gifts, and that they do have a sort of a direct spiritual phone line to Christ in a sense. So there may be a Christ party, but it's also quite possible that this I am of Christ is Paul's little rhetorical flourish to say, look, if you're going to affiliate yourself with Paul or Apollos or Cephas, um, what's, the, what's, the, what's the ultimate absurd outcome of this? Well, in fact, we're all, we're all of Christ. And he'll, he'll say this at the end of chapter 3. Um, so you're actually causing divisions in this church. Paul isn't necessarily quite being as modest as he seems, because as the argument goes on, by the end of chapter 4, they only have one father in Christ, and that's Paul. So they really want him to submit to Paul after all. I am the apostle to the Gentiles, as he says in 9, 1 to 3. I am the apostle sent to you. You need to submit to me. Um, but already we're getting, from, from these rather innocuous musings about who he might have baptised, we're already getting quite a lot of, quite a, a picture building up of what could be going on here. Um, Christ sent me not to baptise, but to preach the gospel, not in wisdom of words, lest the cross should be, me, uh, should be emptied of its power. I'm mixing up these two translations now. Christ sent me not to baptise, but to preach the gospel. So there we're getting one of those few references we get to Paul's commission, his revelations. Uh, another point is 1 Corinthians 9, 1 to 3. And the, uh, the most uh, dramatic moment is 2 Corinthians 12, where he actually describes this heavenly journey he's been on. And uh, Galatians 1, 30, um, 15 forward is another point where he talks about Christ being revealed to him. It's his job. It's his job to be apostle to the Gentiles. He takes it very seriously, so they need to listen to him. He's addressing Gentiles. We know he is because he says, when you were Gentiles, in um, 12, 1 or 2. And we know they're still going to heathen, uh, pagan um, idol temples in chapter 8. Um, what do we get on the next sheet? I am actually proceeding through my notes, but we did, once again, my timing's terrible, and I'm getting near... We've got 15 minutes to go, and it would be nice to be able to talk a little bit. I'll go a bit quicker through the last few points. We've talked about apostles on the household payroll. We do get a sense that there are some social divisions in Corinth that Paul's objecting to. If you read Gert Tyson, I think it's 1981, on the reading list, he brings this out beautifully. Paul says in 1, uh, 1 Corinthians 1.26, not many of you were powerful or wealthy or of noble, or powerful, wise or of noble, noble birth when you were called, which suggests that some of them were and most of them aren't. So you've got your wealthy, well-educated, powerful patrons and then the various dependents and, and servants and slaves and households who belong to these house groups. Um, you also see at the Lord's Supper that some people are eating fine food and other people are going hungry. Well, this seems to correspond to Greek or Roman dining habits where it was actually important to show your own rank by where you sat at the table and what quality of food and wine you had. So if you were the wealthy patrons, you sat at one end and ate the best food and drank the wine. And as you proceed down the table, you get more and more plain food and less and less wine. Um, 
it may be that the Corinthians are treating the Lord's Supper as a, a, a sort of a boozy dining club, which would be typical in uh, Corinth and, and any Greek or Roman city. And they didn't have the same distinction between secular and religious that we do. So at any, at any meeting where you, any dinner would be patronized by somebody wealthy and you'd get invited along if you were less wealthy. There would always be some libations to various gods during the meal and it would be, in, a, by, in our terms, a, a religious affair among other things. Um, and you would always have these distinctions in status and food quality. So it looks like they're treating it as a familiar meal in the way that they know. Well, of course, we can understand them because that's habitual to them. But Paul's objecting to this and saying, no, I want uh, equality. Um, this is where I get very briefly to mention the, the body image. <laughs> um, he says, this is where our commentaries come in, because we'd never guessed this. He asks them in 1.10, I ask you that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and judgment. Or one might translate that joined together in the same mind and same judgment. Or you might translate it, you be mended or repaired in the same mind and judgment. The verb is katatidzo. And it's classically used of mending a broken bone in a body or restoring the unity in a social body, in a social group or a political party. Um, and I refer you to Dale B. Martin's book called The Corinthian Body, which is absolutely fascinating insight into Greco-Roman ideas of body and soul in individual humans and also cities and groups and communities were thought of as bodies and they could either be broken or united in quite, um, in, in our terms, biological or medical terms. Um, Eleven, I've actually mentioned the, the way this child language, he, he demeans them slightly throughout the letter, starting with, I am of Paul, I am of Cephas, I am of Apollos, in our passage, and continues to refer to them as rather childish through the letter. Um, the rhetorical purpose of that presumably being for Paul to be able to tell them, look, your behaviour, which you may find acceptable uh, of having divisions among yourselves, is actually very childish and you need to grow up. Um, there's one other point I was just thinking of. What was it? Oh yes, I've mentioned these house churches all the way through, Stephanus and his household being baptised. Houses probably got together on their Sabbath, whatever day of the week that was, to worship as houses. Only sometimes do all the Corinthians gather as one single community to worship. Because he says in chapter 11, when you gather as one church, I hear there are divisions among you. So the implication is, they're meeting quite often as individual house churches and not all meeting together. It's estimated we've got between about 50 and 100 Christians in Corinth at this period. Not many, perhaps a dozen houses, no more. Um, his rant against wisdom in particularly chapters 1 to 4, but it comes up again in chapters 13, 12, 13 and 14, Maybe because some in Corinth have criticised Paul for being not particularly eloquent and not particularly well educated, whereas Apollos, Apollos has been elevated as being very eloquent. There are hints from Acts, is it Acts 18, that Apollos was very eloquent and wise. Uh, there are hints from two Corinthians that Paul is thought of as not much to look at and not much to listen to in, in person, but he writes bold letters. <laughs> um, so Paul's rather defensive. Uh, relegation of worldly wisdom to this perishing realm in 1 Corinthians 2 and 3 and his, uh, his um, ownership, or not ownership, but his, um, his affi affiliation of himself with the spirit and the power of God, of God and, and the wisdom of God seems to be part of this polemic. Uh, 
Because as Kingsley Barrett famously pointed out, if some are for Paul and some are for Apollos and some are for Cephas, that suggests that some are against Paul. So there's this uh, common view that Paul is being quite strongly criticised in some quarters in Corinth. Margaret Mitchell famously argued against that and said, no, Paul is not being judged or criticised at all in Corinth. He's just fabricated these moments where he says, I don't mind if you judge me in 1 Corinthians 4 and 1 Corinthians 9. And she says that's just a rhetorical strategy for him to get certain points across. But I'm, I'm rather inclined to think that some are criticising Paul and he's, that's why he sounds so defensive. So I've tumbled towards the end a little bit. Um, but just at the very end of the notes, we're trying to create a coherent reading of the passage. There's lots of things to pick out of the passage. Um, we're not trying to produce an atomized sequence of unrelated observations or on individual words and ideas in the passage. That'll get us some marks, we'll probably pass, but it's not going to be a coherent reading of the passage. And we're not going to try and say everything that could possibly be said on the passage. You can't do that in an exam or even probably in a lifetime. We're not going to try and produce a list of parallels between this passage and other New Testament texts as they spring to mind, because that's not a critical attempt to focus on the passage in context. And we're not going to write a homily or a sermon on what I think the passage means, because that's a different task. Uh, our exegesis is a critical reading of the passage. So critical means every assertion you make, you back up with some evidence from the passage or from somewhere else in 1 Corinthians, and you make an argument. You try to place the passage in its context within 1 Corinthians, literary context and historical context um, within the uh, historical period that you've learned about from your reading. Uh, your critical reading will identify the passage's role in Paul's wider argument. Try to work out what you think the wider argument is, what Paul's rhetorical strategy is for persuading the Corinthians, and then see how this passage works there. Identify some elements that seem important to you, not everything, because you haven't got time, and trace how these elements relate to the wider letter. Well, well it's, I'm, glad, I'm glad we met um, and that you've all got faces because with the international programme people are sort of often only names or numbers so it's very nice to see you all and we can talk about these things a little bit more later on over some tea. So thank you all for coming. Thank you.